Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. I'm just across from uh, Billings Bridge uh, Shopping Mall in Ottawa, right next to the uh, Rideau River. And uh, because of all the uh, rapid uh, snow melt and uh, rain, the river is uh, getting significant flooding. I'll just uh, scan the camera so you can see what's going on. So the actual uh, those trees in the background that you can see are, um, that's the normal bank of the river. The river is normally on the other side of those trees in the background. So uh, I don't know, I don't know how far up we are, how far up the water is, but we're getting significant flooding in this park. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, geoengineering, okay? Geoengineering, uh, the word sends shivers through the spines of many people. They, uh, even though they may not know anything about it, uh, they're absolutely against it completely. We've messed up the atmosphere, we've changed the, the chemistry of the atmosphere of our planet, and now we actually have the gall, the gall to uh, think that we have the knowledge to, um, to change the chemistry um, or, or to change the uh, system to cause cooling, um, either through uh, carbon dioxide removal, CDR is one method, or SRM, solar radiation managed, is another method. So people are, are justifiably concerned because they think that, um, you know, if we do any geoengineering that will uh, make things much, much worse. So just leave the system alone. The problem is, is that leaving the system alone, as we can see, is uh, not, not, not a good thing. We're getting extreme weather events ramping up around the world. The Arctic is warming like crazy. The jet streams are, are becoming very wavy. Uh, we have more water vapor in the atmosphere, so we're getting more torrential rains and flooding events. Um, and our food supplies will be, uh, you know, are, are being affected. Prices will, will go up. And it's going to get a lot worse as the uh, Arctic sea ice and snow cover drop continues, if it does continue the exponential trend downward to zero in about 2016. Um, so what, I, what I've written, one blog I wrote on geoengineering is, if you just Google anthropogenic um, Arctic volcano, um, then you'll find a blog that I did um, on uh, geoengineering. Now, originally I submitted this blog to Sierra Club Canada, but they, um, they removed it. I think there were probably complaints, but it went up on Sam Carana's uh, mirrored it, and it's up on his site. So, and it was funny with Sierra Club because I said, oh, hey, put the blog back up. People want to read it. And they said, oh, you know, we're doing some edits to it and da-da-da, and of course it never went back up. So that's fine. I don't, I don't mind. I mean, it's up elsewhere. Uh, Sierra Club's great. Um, so anyway, um, so geoengineering, yes. So, so the, uh, the premise is, um, is that we, if we cool the Arctic, if we can somehow cool the Arctic, well, first of all, we have to slash emissions. We don't have a choice. Most geoengineering methods do nothing about um, the ocean acidification unless they remove CO2 from the atmosphere and bring us down to about that 350, according, you know, this is the number that James Hansen has thrown out, 350 parts per million, um, perhaps even 300, you know, back to where we were um, uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so that's done, the CDR method, carbon dioxide removal method involves uh, that type of thing but it's not going to be quick enough um, you know the ice we've only got um, a few, we've only got three three four years maybe before the sea ice is gone um, max if you look at the if you consider the Maslowski model which is the US Naval uh, graduate Naval Research uh, Center um, that, that model says uh, sea ice is gone 2016 plus or minus three years, um, and that's the highest resolution, uh, smallest grid size model that we have. And Peter Wadhams, um, Arctic sea ice expert uh, extravaganza with over 300 papers, 40 years studying the Arctic, 
and uh, many, many trips on nuclear submarines, British nuclear submarines on the ice. This is what he says um, the ice is, he agrees that the ice is likely to be gone um, by that time. If you just look at the trends, then it's going quickly. So we don't have a lot of time. We have to slash emissions, there's no question. The carbon era, um, fossil fuel era, um, is will be winding down. There'll be a last gas from them. It's not going to go down easy, but people want to survive. And business as usual just isn't, isn't an option. I did a, did a video just uh, yesterday on um, the idea of, uh, you know, near-term human extinction. What does near-term mean? You know, is it 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years? Um, you know, people have different views on that. So, so we have, it goes without saying that we have to slash emissions. Now, I joined a group called Arctic Methane Emergency Group about two and a half years ago, and this is basically what we think we need to do. We need to cool the Arctic. We need to use geoengineering to cool the Arctic. How do we do that? Well, we have a couple of ideas. One is, of course, simulating the um, anthropogenic Arctic volcano putting up sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, cooling the stratosphere over the Arctic, um, decreasing the temperature there, increasing the temperature gradient with the equator, and basically restoring the temperature, uh, um, si the temperature uh, gradients of the system um, to bring back the, to reduce extreme weather events and buy us time to continue slashing emissions. Um, another idea is marine cloud brightening. So we, ev we, we evaporate, we um, pump seawater up droplets into the low atmosphere over the Arctic. We ca create clouds which reflect more light. The sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere does the same thing. It reduces the incoming solar radiation on the planet. Now, people say that uh, this method could cause droughts in the... Um, it could, it could cause the monsoon to fail in India, for example. Well, I, if you just look at the, the overall system, right? It, 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 what, what determines the behavior is the temperature gradient. So I would argue that if you look at the overall system, I don't think the monsoon uh, failure is a big risk. I think that... Um, we would be much more likely to restore um, the temperature gradient and get back to what we had before. We could do it in a graduated fashion. We could start small and work our way up and see what the response is. This is the uh, bike path. I'll just bring the camera over here because it's interesting. You can see the bike path, you know, disappearing into the water. So that would be kind of neat to, to, to bike across and see how far you could make it. But anyway, um, we've been, humans have been geoengineering the planet since we first appeared, but we've done it in a, in a sort of a random fashion. We've, uh, chopped down trees, we've created croplands, that's changed the reflectivity of the surface, you know, in a way that's geoengineering. You know, anything we do you know, when we build cities, when we lay pavement, we're changing the, anything that changes the reflectivity of light off the surface could be arguably called geoengineering. Um, so I was, up, I should set the, for the record, I've always been, I was always against geoengineering until two and a half years ago. Then I realized that uh, the climate system is spiraling out of control too quickly and uh, we're, we're limited in options. We have, I don't think we have any choice. I think we're gonna have to try to, to, uh, to actually think about how we're changing the climate and do things that do that to cool it. Whereas up to now in human history, that's never been an issue. You know, um, we've done loads of things uh, to build up civilization. Each one of those things is affecting the climate. And these, uh, the net effect is that we're getting the warming. So all geoengineering is, is it's using our brains and actually 
thinking about what we're doing in order to cool the climate. Um, so anyway, that's where I stand. Um, and we know that when a big volcano goes off and puts the ash and sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, the climate cools. Pinatubo um, did such a thing, uh, was large enough to affect the climate. It decreased the global average temperature about half a degree uh, for several years. And it was in 91-92, uh, and uh, we, have, so, so we, we have satellite data from 79 onwards. So Pinatubo um, has been studied in, it, extensively, and uh, we can see how, when the volcano happened, we can see how long it took the emissions, the, the gases, to spread around the planet. We can see how the cooling propagated around the planet from the uh, sulfur dioxide. We know it's the sulfur dioxide. So it's a, good, it's a good case study. So we know that this will work with the sulfur dioxide. And the amount of sulfur dioxide is minimal. Of course, sulfur dioxide causes acid rain, but the uh, sulfur coming, for when you burn coal, it's usually lots of sulfur in it. Sulfur goes into the atmosphere, but it's in the low atmosphere. And uh, the amount we'd be putting in the stratosphere is, is low, much lower than what we would have, what we put in day in and day out uh, with coal burning power plants. Thank you.